to God be the glory. As Jesus was heading to the cross, one of the things that he saw fit to do was to offer up prayer to God. In John 17, we have Jesus with his eyes raised toward the heavens as he prays for himself, and then he prays for the apostles, and lastly, he transitions and he prays for those that would believe on him through the apostles' word. In John 17, we not only have an example of Jesus praying, but we find out what means the most to him, things that ultimately matter, things that we as his people today must continue to strive to do, to be the answer to Jesus' prayer. It's challenging, but it's doable as Jesus was not praying for the impossible. As we study John 17, let us resolve to be the answer to his prayer. Before the angry mob came to get Jesus, before the betrayal, before the false accusations, the cursing, the spitting, or the scourging, before they ever drove nails through his hands and placed the crown of thorns on his head, before any of those things took place, there was prayer. Jesus was often found praying throughout his life. He would get up early in the morning and get away from the crowds to pray by himself, Mark 1.35. He gave a brief outline and a pattern to follow and what we know as the model prayer, Matthew 6, 9-13. When he came up out of the waters of baptism, Luke tells us in that moment he was praying, Luke 3 and verse 21, and on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses and Elijah. Even then he was praying, Luke 9, 28. He never once put a morsel of food to his mouth throughout his entire earthly ministry without first looking up to heaven and giving thanks to the Heavenly Father, John 6 and verse 11. One of the most intense prayers that we ever read of Jesus uttering is in the Garden of Gethsemane when he prays for himself in the agony that was so intense he cried out for God to rescue him if it was according with his will. And his sweat became as great drops of blood falling to the ground, Luke 22, 39 through 44. But the prayer in John 17 is different from all these others. It's the same Jesus praying to the same God, but his focus and the content of his prayer differs on this occasion. John has been called by some the high priestly prayer, or the prayer in John 17 has been referred to as the high priestly prayer because in that prayer it is dripping with Jesus' intercession on behalf of his people. John is the only one of the gospel writers who records this prayer, and we are glad that he did. Many of the other occasions in the gospels tell us that Jesus prayed, but we don't know exactly what he was saying in those moments, but here we do. However, more important than the model for how to pray, how to pray and what to say, this prayer is more important because it tells us Jesus was praying for his people. Jesus was praying for those who would believe based on the apostles' testimony. As he was preparing to head to the cross, he had our sins on his shoulders and our names on his lips. Jesus was thinking of Christians but he was not thinking just random thoughts. His prayer was precise and specific. It was pointed. Jesus begins this prayer in verses one through five by praying for himself. Jesus calls on the Father to glorify him so that in turn, he, the Father would be glorified as well. He tells the Father that he finished the work that he was assigned in verse four, and he longs for the glory he enjoyed with the Father before the world, exi the word, the world existed in verse five. And then from verses 6 through 26, he prays for his people. He prays some things limited specifically to the apostles, but then there are other things that apply more broadly to his people everywhere down through the centuries and even up to the present. He's emphatic that he's not praying for the world, but this is a personal prayer for his own. We need to read this prayer often and study it to be sure that if we're Christians, we're behaving like those who want to be the answer to this prayer and not antagonistic toward it. This lesson is for Christians, yes, but it's also for those that are not Christians. This sermon is for non-Christians who've never turned to Jesus in belief and been baptized in water to have their sins forgiven. It's what Jesus says he wants for his people, that those that stand in opposition to this prayer need to realize as long as they do, they're his continual enemies. But those that are Christians, we need this prayer so that we might be who he wants us to be in this world. Let us notice what Jesus prayed for his people in John 17. Let's begin in verses 15 and 16. The first thing Jesus prays for his people is that we would be secure from evil. Throughout the Gospel of John, John uses the word world or cosmos, and it sometimes refers to all people everywhere. That is, humanity in general. That's the way he uses the word in John 1 and verse 10 or in John 3, 16. But throughout chapter 17, almost every time John uses the word, he uses it to mean unbelievers, those whose lives are not in line with the truth of the gospel. John has been clear that he is not praying for the world, and Je Jesus has been clear that he's not praying for the world in John 17 and verse 9, and now he speaks of his disciples and, his re and their relationship to those in the world. And so he says in John 17, 15, and 16, I pray not that you would take these out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. 
What does he pray in reference to his followers, followers' relationship with unbelievers? Number one, that we not be taken out of the world, but also number two, that we would be kept from the evil one. I think the first request is an interesting one. Jesus doesn't pray for our rescue from the world, but instead for our resolve against evil and our protection against it. It's what Jesus offered in the model prayer in Matthew 6 and verse 13, that we wouldn't be led into temptation, but instead that we would be delivered from the evil one. The New Testament assures us elsewhere that in order to get away from all sin, we would have to go outside of the world, which is not going to happen. That's impossible, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, 9 and 10. Jesus assured his disciples that in the world we will have tribulation and evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, 2 Timothy 3, 12 and 13. And yet, with knowledge of all of these things, Jesus didn't pray that we would be given a divine cubicle and be placed separate from the world. He instead prayed that God would keep his people from the evil one and protect us. The evil one, or the one ultimately responsible for the evil we see in the world, is Satan and his influence. He's the prince of this world, as John calls him in John 12, 31 and John 14, 30. He's the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. He's the wicked one, under whom the whole world is under his control or his sway, 1 John 5, 18 and 19. With all that the devil has in his arsenal to trip up God's children, it's great news to know that Jesus prayed for our protection beforehand. Based on this request from Jesus, we should appreciate that there's not much we can do about the evil that is out there. But our focus needs to be making sure that the evil does not get in here, in our hearts, in our lives. Psalm 139, 23 and 24, David says, Search me and know my heart, know my anxieties, and lead me in the way everlasting. Keep me from the evil one. The instructions for a car wash are really the same no matter where you are. In fact, even if you wash your own car at home using your own water holes, the same instructions apply. They always tell you, make sure the windows are rolled all the way up and that your doors are locked. And then as the shampoo squirts out and water sprays, no matter how hard and how fast it does, the inside of the car and those inside cannot be harmed or affected. Nothing on the outside can harm the inside. And Jesus is praying this for us. Father, there's a lot going on out there in the world, but keep those inside of our house safe and secure from evil. David said in Psalm 121, verse 7 and verse 8, The Lord will preserve you from all evil. The Lord will preserve your soul. The Lord will preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Knowledge of this prayer from Jesus alerts us to a few realities. If we would make it from earth to heaven, we'll have to do it through this world. There's no utopian society emerging for Christians in this life. We must win the battle on the devil's turf. Also, there is assurance that God will keep us and protect us while we're here. Second Thessalonians 3 and verse 3 says, The Lord is faithful and he will establish you and guard you from evil. John says the wicked one cannot be touched by the evil one because he's God's child. First John 5, 18. Jesus died to deliver us from this present evil age. Galatians 1 and verse 4. And the Lord delivered Paul from all of the, every evil work and preserved him into his heavenly kingdom. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 18. And we can be assured that he has done and will continue to do the same for us. However, if we forsake his protection, we will be influenced and overcome by the evil that surrounds us. If you go through a car wash and let down the windows, prepare for the tsunami that will enter. And if you go through the world and abandon God's security, the world can and will influence us as the wicked one will enter, take up residence, and ultimately destroy us. And so Paul admonished the Ephesians in Ephesians 4.27, do not give place to the devil. Don't give him a launching pad. Jesus knew his people would be hated and mistreated by the world. He says as much in John 17 and verse 14. In John 15, 18 and 19, he says, if they hated me, they'll hate you. But this does not mean that we have to be molded by them. Don't let the evil be once named among us. Let us live as God would have us. We're to have no fellowship or participation with the unfruitful works of darkness. Using the excuse that, well, I'm in the world. What do you expect? It's all around us won't do. Because in this prayer, Jesus acknowledged that reality. And still he prayed for us not to be poisoned by the evil that's here. We're not to be conformed, but instead transformed by the renewing of our minds, Romans 12 and verse 2. And so Jesus prayed that we would be secure from evil, and that will only be true as long as we choose so. Number two, Jesus prayed that his people would be set apart by Scripture. In John 17 and verse 17, he says, Sanctify them through the truth, your word is truth. 
In John 17 and verse 19, he says, For this cause I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified in me. Jesus prayed that his people, though living in the world, would be different, and that the thing that would make us different in his eyes would be our relationship to the truth, his word. Jesus prayed that we would be sanctified through the truth, and then he tells us his word is truth. The word sanctify, hagiatso here means to consecrate something or dedicate it, set it aside for a special purpose. God's people are set aside and different from the world. And what sets us apart is ultimately the truth. In 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13, Paul praised the Thessalonians because when they received the word of God, they received it as it is in truth. The words from God, not the words of man. Christians are not to be different from the world because we're strange in all the wrong ways. We're to be set apart and different because we're scripturally directed. Man shall not live by bread alone. He can't, but by every word that proceeds by the mouth of the living God, Matthew 4 and verse 4. While the rest of the world is directed by their feelings, their wishes, their own desires and thoughts, we're to be directed by what the Bible says. His word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, Psalm 119, 105. The commandment is a lamp and the law a light, Proverbs 6 and verse 23. As a millennial, I've often wondered how on earth people got around before a GPS was readily available on your phone. What did people do about directions? We don't even think about it now, but it wasn't always this way. The response is typically, well, we just knew how to read a map or maybe MapQuest. We knew our way or we would just get lost until we found our way. But those without divine directions are lost and will never simply just find their way without God's word. Order my steps in your word, the psalmist prays in Psalm 119, 133. Jesus prayed that we would be set apart by his truth, the word of God. And this is something we should expect. That means to be set apart, we will not be like everyone else. Our worship, our service is not going to look like everyone else's. Our family is not going to function like everyone else's. We won't be the same kind of employee as everyone else. The reason why is because the truth of the word of God is designed to make us different in all the right ways. We're chosen and special people, Titus 2, 14. Never apologize for this. Never be ashamed of it. Never wish it were otherwise, because this is exactly what Jesus prayed for. John Stott said a key to Jesus's Sermon on the Mount is basically don't be like them. Matthew 6 and verse 8, Jesus says that about giving and praying and fasting. And it's a part of his his prayer here. You've heard it said, Jesus often said, but you're different. Be different. You march to the beat of a different drum, a divine drum, the truth of God. You might already be aware that in 2016, the Oxford Dictionary declared post-truth to be the word of the year. And this is how they define the word. It's an adjective relating to circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than emotional appeal. Here's the problem of our lifetime right here. This idea of post-truth, the reason why we struggle to discuss simple things about right and wrong, sin and righteousness, good and evil with our friends and family and neighbors is because the world has convinced most people that there's no such thing as truth. There's your truth and their truth, his truth and her truth, but there is no truth that applies to everyone and don't dare and try to tell us otherwise. But this prayer from Jesus has always mattered. But especially now, we're to be set apart by what Jesus calls in verse 17, the truth, the immutable word of God, which is true for everyone at all times. Second John 2 says the truth will be with us forever. Jesus sets himself apart to die so that we might be set apart by the truth. That's what he says in verse 19. John's gospel is focused on the truth and he links our relationship to Jesus to our relationship to the truth. Notice how often in John's gospel, this idea of truth comes up, especially in relation to Jesus. He's filled with grace and truth, John 1, 14. Grace and truth come through Jesus Christ, John 1, 17. God wants worship to be done in spirit and in truth, John 4, 23 and 24. The truth will liberate us or set us free if we continue in his word, John 8, 31 and 32. Jesus says, I am the truth, John 14, 6. And when he stood before Pilate, he said, I came in order to bear witness of the truth, John 18 and verse 37. We're sanctified by the truth of the entirety of God's word, but especially our response to Jesus. Are we Christians and are we living the way that he wants us to? James says in James 1.21, Lay apart all filthiness and overflowing wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. 1 Peter 1 and verse 22 says, We're born again by the word of truth that's found in the gospel. 
Sometimes the religious world may steal terms that are biblically defined and redefine those terms. And then God's people are afraid to use those words. We become fearful or hypersensitive to using those terms. However, we don't have God's permission to lease out his words or to give them up. Sanctified is a biblical word reserved for the people of God. This sanctification begins when we obey the gospel. First Peter one and verse two, those who have never repented and been baptized into Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins are not set apart from Jesus, but they're set apart from him. Be reconciled, be brought near by the truth. What does the word say is what we should be asking. Those who have done that must remain distinct as our lives are ordered by scripture. We must not be set apart by a favorite news station, our social commentator, or political party, our race, ethnicity, or sports teams, or any other superficial thing that could distinguish us. Let us be marked out as people of God by the word of God. When the Jews saw the apostles in Acts chapter 4, they beheld the boldness with which they spoke. And in Acts 14, Acts 4 and verse 13, they took knowledge that they had been with Jesus. They were set apart and distinguished by their relationship to the truth. Jesus prayed that we would be secure from evil as his, as his people, that we would be set apart. But then the third thing he says is that we'd be sent into the world. John 17 and verse 18, Jesus says, as, I, as I've sent them, I've sent them as you've sent me into the world. The third thing he prays is that we would be sent into the world. This one is not so much a request that he makes of the Father, but it is more stated as a fact to be accepted. Just as the Father sent Jesus into the world, Jesus sent his disciples into the world. One commentator says this is what's called a proleptic statement, meaning Jesus spoke about this happening before it actually occurred. Though Jesus sent his apostles out on what's known as the limited commission, he had not yet sent them into all the world. However, after his crucifixion and resurrection and ascension, the disciples would be sent into all the world, Mark 16, 15. In John's gospel, in John 20 and verse 21, he says, now I'm sending you into all the world. And Matthew records the same as the great commission is captured in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. What will begin in Jerusalem was spread to Judea and Samaria and then to the uttermost parts of the earth, Acts 1 and verse 8. But Jesus is so sure that his disciples would go into all the world and obey him that he can speak of verse eight, in verse 18 of them having already been sent. Though they had not yet gone, they eventually would. Acts 8 and verse 4, Luke records for us as the gospel began to spread those that were scattered abroad, they went everywhere preaching the word. In answer to Jesus' prayer in John 17 and verse 18, Acts 8 and verse 4 says, this is exactly what they did. What Jesus started, we must finish. Appreciate, appreciate his choice words as he parallels his mission to that of the disciples. As you've sent me into the world, so also I've sent them. This means we're not only saved from the world, but for the world. We're to be the example that Jesus wants us to be. We're to pick up where Jesus left off in his mission to seek and save the lost, Luke 19, 10. We're to be about our father's business as he was, Luke 2 and verse 49. We're to introduce people to the one who gives the abundant life in John 10 and verse 10. It makes sense that he would not take us out of the world because if he did, that would remove the light. And we're here to shine and point people to God, Philippians 2, 15. July 26, 1775, the U.S. Postal Service was established by the Second Continental Congress with Benjamin Franklin serving as his first postmaster general. Franklin served for a year in that position and greatly improved the mail system. In 1789, there were about 75 post offices and today there are more than 40,000. They deliver over 200 billion pieces of mail annually. Our mail service is pretty efficient. It does exactly what it was designed to do. What about us as Christians? You know, Jesus started by sending a small group of men into the world, and by the middle of the first century, they had gotten the gospel into the entire known world. Paul was able to write in Colossians 1.23 that every creature under heaven had heard the gospel. Jesus sent his disciples into the world like he went. Think about it. If Jesus went about his business like we're going about ours, would he have gotten anything done? Someone says, yes, but Jesus is God and his divinity gave him an advantage. That may be true, but not quite. Jesus says in John 14 and verse 12, the works that I do, you'll do greater. You know, people say times have changed. Punishment for children used to be that you will not be allowed to go outside. You'd have to stay inside instead. But now with technology, tablets, smartphones, no one wants to go outside. Being pushed outdoors might be seen as a punishment for some. It's interesting that the first disciples seemed ready to go. They couldn't wait to take the whole gospel to the whole world. Jesus actually had to caution them. You remain in Jerusalem until you're properly equipped with the Holy Spirit, Luke 24 and verse 49. But now that we have completed, we have the completed revelation of God, sometimes it seems 
like we need to be pushed out and forced out into the mission field to do what God would have us to do. Based on Jesus's prayer, we should appreciate that we're here for a reason. If you're a Christian at this point in time, in this place, God has placed you here to make a difference. We've been sent into whatever area of the world we occupy to make things better, not in some temporary superficial way, but in an eternal way through the gospel. I guess we understand this with foreign missionaries. We support them to go somewhere and be about the gospel. They have lives and interests and hobbies, but their primary goal, their primary role is to share the gospel. What if a missionary was coming back to give a report about his foreign mission work and he came back on a visit and reported about the weather, the food and the culture. And he mentioned nothing about his evangelistic efforts. And he said, you know, I'm working on it. I've got other things going on. I plan to get to that later. There would be a serious conversation about what his work is accomplishing and whether or not he should continue to be supported in our own way and in our own sphere of influence. We're missionaries. And here's the question. If we had to put together a missionary report of what we're doing for the cause of Christ in our current context, what would it consist of? What would you say? Would there be anything to report? I'm working on this person, or I'm trying to influence them, or I'm praying for and with them. In three years, Jesus filled the world with good deeds. John 21, 25 said he did so many of them. If each of them were written down, the world itself couldn't contain the books that would be written. Souls were restored and the first Christians did likewise. In Acts 17 and verse 6, Jesus sends us into the world to do the same. The fourth thing that we see Jesus praying for his people is for scriptural unity. In John 17 and verse 20 and 21, he says, Neither pray I for these alone, that is for the apostles, but for them also which will believe on me through their word, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world might believe that you've sent me. Jesus prays that those who believe based on the apostles' testimony would all be united, that we'd all be one. Sometimes people foolishly charge members of the Church of Christ with being members of a cult as if we've invented this idea of the one church. But the reality is this is false, that Jesus prayed that we would all be united. To claim that there is one body where all of the saved reside is not a cultic idea, but a Christ-like idea, because this is exactly what he prayed for the apostles and what the apostles pleaded with men to become. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, Paul begged the Corinthians to be united. He begged them by the mercy, by the name of Jesus Christ, that they would all speak the same thing and that there would be no division among them, but that they'd be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. One thing is for certain. Jesus is not okay with the religious division. Notice how many times in John 17 alone, he emphasizes this idea that he wants the disciples to be one. He says, be one as I am with the father in John 17 and verse 11. He prayed that we might all be one in John 17 and verse 21. He he mentions it again in verse 22. And then in verse 23, he says that they might be perfectly one. Don't let anyone tell you that denominationalism is inevitable, that there's nothing we can do about being religiously divided, that it's all pretty much similar. And God is not concerned about those small deviations and differences. Jesus prayed against it. He wants us to be united based on the apostles' testimony about him in Acts 2 and verse 42. The unity we enjoy with each other is centered around and based on Jesus. The greatest thing that ever happened to the church of Christ is Jesus Christ. We're based, we're unified based on him and his teaching. This means at least two things. When people are broken up into different groups, this is a disrespect to Jesus's request. And when there is division with Jesus's name attached to it, it doesn't help others to believe. The denominational world needs to hear this message, open their hearts, ears, and close their doors. Jesus didn't pray for churches built on the foundations of men, but instead the unity of believers based on the foundation of the inspired apostles' testimony. John 16, 13 says that they be guided into all the truth. Those that belong to Jesus, churches that are his, churches of Christ also need to hear this message. It needs to be heard and heeded congregationally and globally. God's people need to stick together. As long as unity revolves around God's word, we shouldn't divide. We shouldn't run from a challenge. We shouldn't splinter off. We should be those individuals that are the one body. We should be rooting each other on globally and viewing ourselves as teammates and not as competing teams vying for some plastic trophy, but for the eternal prize, as Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 9, 25. Jesus prayed for scriptural unity. We don't all get to hold hands and agree to disagree and claim to be united in the way that Jesus says we must be. Jesus is arguing for unity based on the apostles' word about him. That means we need to be sitting down with open Bibles and in the areas where God has already bound things, we need to be united and give up our previously held opinions. We need to surrender those things. 
and areas where there's liberty and room for differing opinions, we must release our dogmatism so that we don't disrupt what unity Jesus wants us to have. We must endeavor or do everything possible to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There's only one church because that is what Jesus promised. This is what the apostles preached, and this is the answer to Jesus' prayer. I was visiting a member of the church one time at the hospital, and there was a man there who seemed to be somewhat religious. And I invited him to services. And he had various reasons on certain things that would probably prevent him from being with us. But he encouraged me not to be a fraud. He said, if you're naming the name of Jesus, do the right thing. Because many people in your position often claim to follow God, but they fall short of his righteous standard. I encouraged him to not let the failings of others push him away. But Jesus seems to imply here that they can. And we should be careful. We should walk in wisdom and redeem the time because the days are evil. Ephesians 5 and verse 16. It's impressive that since more than 100 million people in the U.S. watch the Super Bowl, companies view it as the prime time to get the attention of viewers with their products and services. In 2001, companies paid on average $5.6 million to air a 30-second commercial during the Super Bowl. They think it's worth it because good advertisement matters. Notice that in verse 21 and 23, Jesus says, Our unity matters because it shows the world that God sent Jesus into the world. We're divine advertisement. We must not rep misrepresent him or give the world reason to doubt that he came because of our failure to stick together. Unity matters because Jesus didn't pay a measly $5 million to purchase it. He, in fact, gave his life. Acts 20 and verse 28 says that he purchased the church with his own blood. Ephesians 5.25 says husbands are to love their wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. In John 17, Jesus is praying for his people to glorify him, to be the people that he wants us to be. He ends this prayer in verse 24 by praying that we would see him in his glory. And then in verse 25 and 26, he mentions this idea that we would know the love of God that he has and that we would enjoy it because we know him in truth. Jesus is on his way to the cross in John 17. The weight of the world, the sins of the world are literally on his shoulders, but we are on his mind and on his heart. And he wants us to follow in the steps of the apostles' doctrine, of the apostles' word, so that we might honor him. There are many things in this life that you and I may never do, never accomplish. But this one thing is sure. We can be the answer to Jesus' prayer. We can work to be the people that he would have us to be, living in the world but not influenced by it, sanctified by the truth that we find in Scripture, united in one and going into the world as he did to engage, to correct, to convict, and ultimately to convert. Jesus glorified the Father, and in John 17, he prays that his people would as well.